I would like to introduce the presenter of this seminar tonight, Mr. Saeed Katanfurush, has been structural engineer for more than a decade in Iran, and he has a master's in shell structures and skin structures in Canada, and has been developing mostly solar energy structures for the past 10 years in Canada and recently he has been promoted to the position of project manager in the solar energy uh, enterprises. So I won't hold you any longer and I will ask Mr. Katon Fruch to please present his presentation. Thank you. Good evening everyone. Um, as as you have been heard, my name is Saeed Katanfrush. Uh, I've been graduated in civil engineering in Iran in Azad University. Um, if everyone is curious, uh, in Iraq. And later I came to Canada, I studied my master in steel steam structures, so it's a composite structures. In Ryerson University, graduated in 2012, and been working in solar industry ever since. So uh, it goes back pretty much five or six years that I'm working in solar industry. So hopefully tonight, after my presentation, uh, I would be able to, to add a little bit of uh, information for you. As I may know, uh, most of you may have been uh, familiar with solar industry, but I just do my best to try to, to add a little bit more. Right. Sorry for the interruption. So um, if I may continue, so first of all, maybe everybody likes to know how the solar system will work. Just a really light introduction to solar. Basically, everybody knows the source of providing this energy is from the sunlight. And we usually put the panels on the rooftop somewhere that you can observe most of the sunlight during the day. And that electric power that you get from sunlight, it would turn to the electricity that comes through the wires that comes to your inverter. Mainly, the inverter, what it does, it gets the power, it turns it to, uh, to the DC power, that, uh, like a battery that you can use for your housing, but that's not ready yet. You need to also turn it to the AC. So these combined, these combined slash inverters, they would be able to turn the DC power to the AC, and then you can connect it to the grid, and you can uh, fit the grid, or you can use it for your own purpose. So, but this solar system, how they work in Ontario, so looking at the government regulation, so Ontario government, they started introducing their fifth regulation starting from 2006. 2006, when they start introducing these type of uh, incentive programs, they, they had the intention of supplying and supporting some of the uh, limited uh, renewable energy that keep, they can produce energy. And those uh, resources of energy would be the onshore wind, water power, renewable biomass, biogas, landfill gas, and last one but not least, would be the solar photovoltaic PV modules. This is something that we will focus for today's discussion. So in 2006, when Ontario government started uh, issuing the incentive programs, they started with 42 cents per kilowatt hour. So means per hour of kilowatt generation, you were getting paid only 42 cents for your generation. But they didn't get much of attraction from the investors. What they did, they tweaked the regulation. In 2009, they introduced the feed contract, as we know nowadays, uh, with the highest rate, 80.2. Some people still believe this rate is a gold mine. And the people who invested in that faith, they actually secured themselves for the next 20 years. Respectfully, every year the Ontario government starts reducing the rates by uh, applying more pressure on the domestic production. The first year, in 2009, uh, the domestic content of the uh, products that you needed to have on your rooftop it was at least 20%, which means you have to make sure that 20% of your products were being produced, supplied from Canadian um, institute, uh, sorry, Canadian factories. But later on, from 2009 to 2017, the domestic content of these materials is zero. What does that mean? It means that the removal of those incentives they introduced initially, and they, they push the industry itself to be able to, to stand up for, for its own projects and make sure that they can survive. So, but let's look at the, 
the government and see who's actually looking after it. The ISO government, uh, the ISO is actually the, is the independent electric car system operator. This institution actually empowered by the Ontario Energy Board and what they would do, they will look after all of the production of the gen energy that has been generated in Ontario. So it could be landfill, uh, renewable energies, it could be biomass, it could be nuclear plant, it could be coal, anything. So they're the big institution, they're looking after all of this uh, contract and they're administering all of this <coughs> to make sure all of us have power to our house and uh, we can turn on lights every night. But to look at closer to the ISO's regulation and see what kind of price they were giving to us. They were classifying our, our projects to two major categories for solar projects. As you can see, there are a list of the other renewables that you can see the price, but these updated prices as of July 1st, 2017, but we only focus on these portions. Microfeed projects are the projects that are pretty small and everybody knows, usually works for residential housing and the feed program are the bigger projects. But you can see, as your system capacity reduces, your income would increase. So at the end of the day, if you look at it, this pricing is actually balanced out. So as you increase your capacity, your feed rate would be reduced. But because you have more production, then eventually your income would be higher. But if you look at the microfeed projects, the microfeed projects usually works for residential. These systems are uh, smaller than 10 kilowatt system, and max they can get up to 10 kilowatt system. These are perfect situation for, for the people who's looking for the house, for a residential. If they have like a convenience store, you, you want to put it on top of your uh, commercial building. If, or if you have a farm, you have a barn, and then you want to put your solar panel down there, and you generate your own electricity in you. So this is the only system that you can use for your own uh, small projects. But there's also bigger projects. We have the second category that we call it between 10 kilowatt to 500 kilowatt. These are the, uh, could be the utility scale projects that we built, all of them in Ontario. So if I can classify them as of the rooftop solar projects, they're mainly good for the government building. They're good for big roofs and um, where you have the massive roof available and you don't know what to do with it. You will see most of these uh, commercial buildings and plazas that you walk into, they're divided to so many small in the, in commercial buildings, but the roof is just united, right? So the owner usually give that to the other tenants to put the solar panel up there and generate electricity. So that's how I make it suitable for the landlords because it's to their interest uh, to put the solar panel on top because they make money out of nothing. So that's how they make money. But they're not the only one. We also have another uh, type of the project that we install them all in the, in the ground and we call them ground mount projects. The scale wise, they're, they're not much of different between the rooftop, but the good thing about these projects, they, they usually have massive space available and we put our, our panels right there. These projects, they only good, if you look at my notes down here, they're not good for every farm. People's assumption is you, you can have any type of farm and you can stick the panels on those ones and start generating electricity. No. ISO makes sure that you're not doing the same thing. The intention of this renewable energy is to use the land that is not good for planting any crops. So it means if you're, you're a farmer and you can may use that area to, to plant your crops and make money out of it, the ISO preference is that you should not put your panel there. So, long story short, anywhere that we put our panels, we make sure it's not suitable for farming. So that's how they classify as two major categories. The zoning of your areas should be rural, residential, and the second thing, the, the land class, the soil classification should be four to seven. The soil classification is basically divided between 1 to 7, and 1 to 3 is perfect for, for planting and for crops, and 4 to 7 is not good. But since we know what type of project of solar we're dealing with, let's look at the process of our engineers. So usually being an engineer, you just start getting engaged to, to this solar project as, as, as early as feasibility study. When we apply for application, we, we do the due diligence, we do all of those studies to make sure 
project is viable and we can count on it and we can invest on it and then we proceed with it. But we also have different stages, engineering, we apply for permit, we do the construction, quality control, we do the closing and commissioning, and the last thing we do, it would be the operation and maintenance and asset management of all of these sites. But if you want to look at the feasibility study, uh, what would be the proper feasibility study that you would need to do? The first thing everybody needs to know where you build your site. You need to know your property boundaries. And you need to have the top of elevation about, about your property. But how that works for rooftop? For rooftop projects, you basically have two sources of getting the information. Option A, get the building drawing. Usually if you have an IFC package uh, for your uh, building, what you need to do, you need to find the roof plan, and through the roof plan you can find out where the obstruction would be on the roof and you can do your layout. Or, this is not the case, and I can assure you, after doing dozen and dozen and dozen of these buildings, 10% of Ontario building does have this information. 90% they don't have, and you have to go this way. This way is not really rocket science. You use the Google map. What you would do, you will measure your building. Uh, if, if you can see here clearly, you, you just need to draw your boundaries, you need to draw your obstructions, and you need to avoid those obstructions. As easy as that. And you need to put your pan on it. But that's not the only thing. For the ground mount, the ground mount destroy is a little bit different. You mainly don't have the top of survey of your ground most of the time. You cannot get that type of elevation anywhere with that detail of having the accuracy of 0.25 centimeter on every change elevation. But what you need to do, you can find the general characteristic of your ground. You need to know, you understand where is the valley, where is the pig, and you know where the water will go. And you, you need to show your obstruction. You have trees, maybe you have a house, maybe you have a cottage, or you have a building. You just need to locate those ones, and then you will have a good understanding of your area to build your site. Let me just jump on the shading. So since we know that where we are going to build, the first question you would ask yourself, how you can plant those panels together? Um, Shading it can come with a very uh, simple um, default assessment. You can use December 21st as of the lowest angle of your sun in a year, and which is 23.5 degree tilt. And what you can do, you can put your panel as you like. This is this represents rooftop projects, and this is obviously a glamour. You can play with your tilt and you can find out what would need to be the setback or row interval spacing between your, your modules and you, you understand that how much they need to be apart from each other to not impact in the, the sex. But this is not the only way. But it can get more complex. Ideally, after knowing that concept in your mind, uh, you need to understand and come up with the shading profile. What is that mean? You need to be able to visualize and see if you have an obstruction, what would be the area that would be shaded in the, during the year and which area you need to be avoiding. I can start with the complex one. Uh, I have a master of uh, shading analysis. He's sitting right here. He's actually helping me today. But if I can uh, explain to you, uh, you can see this parabolic shade it has a blue and the purple one. And the blue one is the smaller, the purple one is much wider. You perhaps would ask what is that represent for? That represent four hours window, shade free, in December 21st. If I be correct, or two hours. But the other one, this one, would be only one hour shade free before and after. I could the sleep. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. So it means, well, based on your business plan, based on the financing of your site, which means whoever has his brain behind it has divided the production of the system to different sequences, the two, uh, quarter one, quarter two, three, and four. And based on those ones, this shading would be defined. But if you want to have a rules of thumb, I can make it easy for you. If you imagine you have any obstruction, anything, that has one meter height, 
If you put your obstruction right here, you should avoid three meters front of it and two meters from the side. And the same is scale factor. So as your obstruction increase, so let's say you have five meters of obstruction, this should be 15 meters, and sideways should be nine. Assuming that your south would be at, about, at the bottom and your north would be the, at the top of the projector. But this is not the only way. There is always <coughs> software that can uh, make our life much easier. And the software is that actually is very uh, trustworthy that nowadays pretty much I can say in all over the globe they are familiar with this software is the PVC software. What it does is basically simulate your solar system and tells you what would be the exact production in a given area that you're planning to build your site. So when you look at the system, it can tell you how much would be your production in one year. And based on this one, and based on the number of the panel you have, you know how much your income would be. It also does a little bit more. What it tells you, it can break your monthly basis production and it can tell you how much you can produce in every month from your system. From this one, you can drive and calculate how much would be your expected revenue to capital for the solar system. Perhaps there's a lot of variables placed around in the background of this software to, to just make it work and have an efficient design. But this is that our, this is the software that our industry uses and all of those financing, you know, financial companies you know, counting these ones to, for their loans. One last thing that this PVC does, it gives you the sim simulation. So I'm trying, if I'm not breaking it, uh, I'll try to show it to you. If you look at this one, this shows you the sunlight. And you will see, maybe I should explain it to you first, that these are representing the tree lines. The blue area represents your solar panel. And the gap would be the low interval spacing that has been defined. And the red dots here that actually shows you the sunlight that moves from one side to from sunrise to sunset. And if you could see uh, clearly, which is obviously not, it can give you the time, it can give you the tilt of the sun, and you know when you're causing the shading. I just want to repeat it one more time, just to just to look at it. You see how the shading is changing, mm -hmm. right? This is only for the morning time, and you should expect in the afternoon to start shading right here. Just let it run a bit. <clears throat> so you can see that it starts causing shade at the bottom of the site. And at one point, you will see the panels that start causing shade on, onto each other. So we do all of this study. We do all of this research just to get to the point to create a site plan layer. So this is a sample of two ground mount, one rooftop and one ground mount solar projects. Basically, doing on the ground mounts, you have less restriction, less area to avoid, so you're more relaxed to, to make your site plan work, but obviously you can see some areas you can't build in. So you basically have to avoid it. But on the rooftop, it gets a little bit more complex. So you should do a comprehensive study to understand what would be the shading of your obstruction. So if I can tell you this area, it's like an HVAC unit that you have on the roof. And you see what a big area it just occupies and you cannot put any panel. But you can also see some of the small ones right here that they're impacting but only on one or two panels. So it's important to know what obstruction you have and which one you have to avoid. And if these three lines were sitting here, it was impacting the total area right here and you had to avoid the total area and you couldn't build anything. But let's say we, we do the layout, but everything ends up right here. You need to do your revenue assessment. So how you do it? So let's say you do a layout like this one. You avoid your area for your module. You, you have a number of the panel, which is 79 modules right here. How do you calculate your revenue? Every module has a production rate. So 300 watt, 260, 400, it varies based on the different modules. When you multiply them together, it would give you a kilowatt in DC. As I said earlier, once the, the sunlight change uh, comes to the power, it first it turns to DC, 
and from inverter it passes to AC. In Ontario, based on ISO regulation, AC-DC ratio cannot increase no more than 20%. So if I take that one to account, then dividing my DC output by 1.2, that would give me my AC output. That is the number that we have to look into IESO rates and pick our numbers for. So if you look at that one, for the 20 kilowatt system, the rate is 22.3 cents per kilowatt hour. How would you do your estimation? Then you would multiply 20 kilowatt by 1200, I'll come back to this one, multiply by 22.3 cents per kilowatt hour, and then you would see, you, you would, should expect to get yeah, 5,400 is shy a bit from 5,400 uh, for your annual income. You may ask what would be this 1,200? This is the usable, or maybe I should say, as the useful sunlight hours that you can get in one year. Or I should say, in our terms, we call it the isolation rate. So um, the, the power density of sunlight is really important. So the higher this number goes, in some areas, it's different. Uh, for example, Toronto is different from New York. New York is different from Iran. Uh, but surprisingly, Ontario is only has 400 uh, kilowatt hour per kilowatt less than Egypt. So the, the, the highest intensity of the sunlight that we get is from South Africa. So you can imagine Egypt is fairly high. And the density of this sunlight that we get up here is not much different from what we get in Asia. So, Ontario is 1,400, right? 12, 1,200. So, it varies. Like, let's say, even though if you live in Peterborough, the site you have in Peterborough is different from the site that you have in Niagara Falls. Uh, but it's not really that significant. It, it has a really certain tolerance. But before we go further, I'd like to give you a little bit of introduction of electrical engineering inside of the system, just to get to understand we as of engineers, or maybe I should say more civil structure engineers, if I, if I can assume that way. We will go that way, but I just want to give you a little bit of background. So I can uh, divide electrical designs to two main... Yes, sir. Before going to electrical engineering, I, I have a question. Yes, sir. Yep. Oh, you mean, if, I, if I understood correctly, you mean uh, the building that they put the solar first, they didn't have any building around it, but later on they built one and they actually caused shading. It is that. Uh, <laughs> no, I was talking to you in this regard, so... Um, that's a very, 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 very good uh, question, I would say, because not many of those developers that we see in Ontario, they pay attention to the future development. But... We do have less problem uh, as far as the size we deal with because we are dealing with mainly utility scale size projects, whether you build it in a farm or whether you put it uh, under warehousing. So the chance of getting the mid-rise or, um, or the higher building adjacent to your building is not really that great, but I can, I can see that uh, issue with, the, with residential much more, especially in downtown area in Toronto because they keep developing more buildings, that, that, that for sure could be a concern. I have heard one of the other customers that we had, they actually built one, they're putting the high rise right beside it, but they haven't built one yet. So, I think there should be a lawsuit after that, but <laughs> maybe I can leave it with the lawyers to, to address it, but, but there is some potential. Yeah, for solar it yeah. Yes. Yeah, when For the rooftop, city, yes. Yeah, yes. When city 
I think we can discuss it after the presentation, okay. but, but we would get to the permitting for sure, and then we can discuss it there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so if I can uh, continue for the low voltage designs, basically, if you look at the side plan, like I said, this is a Guaman project you're looking at. The red line that you will see is actually representing the fence line, and you will see these blue um, arrays just running from one side to another is actually representing the modules and the solar panels in the property. But the low voltage is basically the, these electrical engineers, they're looking at the, the connection of these modules together, bringing the power to the disconnects, and then from the disconnect, they will bring it to the combiner, AC combiner, which you can see in your AC pa in your panel in your house. When you look at it, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, it's a much bigger size. And then from that one, the power will come to your inverter, turn to DC, and it would be inverted to, to AC, and from there it will go to your meter if you're going to pass it to the grid, or you can pass it to your house. But for this case, they usually pass it to the grid to, to get the payments for it. And if you want to look at the schematics, what they would usually do, they would show you how the wiring needs to be, where your transformer needs to sit, if you have one where your meter cabinet needs to locate, and where would be the disconnect, and what would be the wiring arrangement. Excuse me. Yes. How about the waste rate in this circulation that we, you know, because from the sun, we have one, two, three, four, six passes. Okay. How, how about the base of the energy, the rate of waste? Uh, usually when we design our system, the losses should not increase no more than 3% to 4%. Yes. Sure. So um, sometimes we need to over-design to, to make sure our, our production. So that's how that 1.2 ratio comes from. Oh, so you, you definitely also need to uh, uh, lack of poor workmanship of the wiring. So so many things can add up. So that 20% overkill design is kind of uh, yes, yeah, guaranteeing you that you at least you reach up to your hundred percent capacity of your AC. So that's that's where that uh, design comes from. Thank you. No problem. So, but but there is a second section that we call it high voltage design. This high voltage is doesn't care anything inside the site. They basically they care anything after the transformer. So basically, they will show you the pole line connections where the pole needs to be connected. And usually these teams, they're looking after the foundation of these pole because they, they put them a lot into the front so they know what type of foundation needs to do. So they're kind of familiar with that area and the wiring arrangement and if there's any guide wires needed. This may not be a huge deal for, for you folks, but, but when you get to, to the construction and get the approval for the landlords from landlords and everybody, this guide wire can just ruin everything for you. So. Right now, we are done with, with sort of feasibility study, but maybe the next step that we need to focus on in Ontario Solar Project is to just focus a little bit more in our area. So in the engineering, the first thing that, imagine that your contract has been awarded. You did your feasibility study, ISO give you a thumbs up and they ask you to proceed. But what would be your first step to do? The first step is to do the site assessment. But if I can start it with the rooftop uh, projects, you can basically do your structure assessment first. And if I may categorize them um, as of two major categories, so it would be the pitch roof that mainly you can find at the pre-engineering building or the ones that we do have the corrugated steel metal sheets. There would be your main target, but nevertheless, there is see the some of the other commercial buildings that they're old-fashioned designs, they see using shingles, they still put in the, the, conven the old convention of um, roof materials, and you need to pay attention to this one. But generally, they're pitched. So when you categorize them, they're sloped. The second category of these structures, it would be the flat roof building. Flat roof is very common in warehousing, and I would say 85% of the building you would look at it, they have the flat roof. But if I can uh, focus a little bit more on the materials, when you have a pitch roof, most of the time, not always, this is for utility scale projects, uh, not for residential, so shingles is not included as part of this discussion. So when you have a pitch roof, mainly your roof material is steel. 
these roof materials are they have a high durability, uh, they have a light weight, they can last so long, and they're very common in <coughs> pre-engineering building. But pay attention, this type of building, in because it's engineering, they they usually maximize the efficiency of the system, and they usually do it to 98 percent of the capacity of the building. So. If you want to consider it for your solar system, mm, ideally not a good idea. So, uh, but you should work around it. And you need to look around the codes to, to find a way. What's the unit weight of these uh, modules? Uh, uh, including the racking, everything in. Uh, we get there, I, I can explain more, but usually the short answer should be 3 PSF, 3.5. It can go up all the way to till 8 PSF. It depends on the racking uh, type of your roof. It depends on the location of your site. Uh, some area in like Kingston in Burlington area, you need to design for seismic load. So it would require much more hefty ballast and, and the concrete to put on the roof. So therefore your ultimate uh, loading would be much higher. But these type of roofs, they are perfect because they have the least required material for clamping and installation. So when you look at the total weight of this system, these are, are much lighter for installation versus the flat roof. But if I can go back on the <coughs> flat roof, there is seven common type of the flat roof in Ontario. Not saying there's no more, but these seven types you will find them very common, 95 to 98 percent, with nothing other than these ones. You either have EPDM, PVC, TPO, or you have a build-up roof, this is very common, either half roll or a cold form, or you have a modified bitumen. I think all of us are, are familiar with, with uh, modified bitumen, we, we call it in Iran Isogon, right? So we use those ones up here too, they have a high durability, but they're expensive. So. Looking at the build-up roof, you can see how many layers of material needs to be applied for the build-up roof to be used, but this is one of the best roofs that you can have and last longer than the others. If you have the modified bitumen, uh, modified bitumen is usually has two plies. The loading is around 10 PSF, including the digs <coughs> and everything together. So uh, it's a good system when you, when you have it fresh installed on the roof. Uh, EPDM, PVC, TPO, TPA, uh, these are like a white membrane like that they just lay it down and they just uh, torque them together. Um, very good material, high durability, uh, and the, edge, and the um, energy consumption of your building, it helps a lot because they're white, so they don't absorb too much of sunlight. But practically, uh, not really. You should be really concerned when you put those ones on the roof, especially in the uh, winter time. Uh, when they have a drop of water on it, you, that's very slippery and you cannot be on the roof at all. During summertime, you can't look at anything because the sunlight, the reflection, it would blind you all the way. Last one, very popular, not really practical in industry, is a hybrid system. Uh, we only have installed one of these hybrid systems on uh, U of T and the architectural building just for the sake of research, including a solar panel. So if you can imagine, this is underneath and on top of it we have a panel, so uh, everything is green, but it's, it's up to research scale, not, not to the industry to use it yet. But maybe next something you want to know is that but you look at all of those roofs, what they mean. So, first of all, the research that has been done in NRCA in 1999, it shows you different types of the roofs and what was the popularity of these roofs in Ontario. But on the left-hand side, it actually gives you a very good conclusion. Can you tell me what type of roofs is good to, to be used for our feed contract? There's only two types. Build-up roof and metal sheets. Pretty much any other roof that you use, you should expect to change your roof before you get the life cycle of your contract is done. So in our assessment, when we, when we go on the rooftops, when we, as soon as we see the build-up roof, we give a thumbs up there. 
doesn't matter what is the stage, right? what is the stage, but it's too bad, it's too good, but we, we need to patch it. The overall life cycle is much better. But you don't find it nowadays. Like, there is one of the most extensive uh, roofs that you can have. As far as the engineering goes, you, you may ask, like, what would be the loading, what would be the implication of that one to your load assessment? The most heaviest roof is the builder roof. It can go all the way, the normal weight is around 14 to 15 PSF, but it can go up all the way up to 20 PSF. Uh, if they apply two layers of, of roof, which I have seen in the lot, that can also drive up to 30 PSF sometimes. <coughs> when you do the white membrane, they usually land around 10 PSF, and when you have the standing seam roof, like this one, including all together, is, is a bit lighter, but around 8 PSF. What we highly recommend as of engineers, when you work on these uh, rooftop projects, to engage with the professional roofers and ask them to do a core cut, not one spot, at least two or three spots on your roof. Because sometimes they patch one portion, but they don't patch it. It doesn't necessarily show on the other side. You need to understand how many layers you have, because you can see how those wastes are adding up together and they're making it so heavy for you that you cannot install. So let's say we're done with the roof, and next step we need to look at the structure itself. Going back, it could be pitch, but, but the main structure could be a wood frame. We usually go inside the building, we look at all of the structures inside, if, there's, if they sound intact, if they're all good, then we take pictures and record it, and we make sure they didn't really um, give up on the quality. But can you tell me what is this picture? I actually took it because when I was sitting, uh, standing in the barn, it was just right beside me. It was too close that I couldn't notice it for like 14 minutes. One of, this is a post. This is one of the, this is this post. Actually, the farmer chopped it off from the bottom that you couldn't see. I could move it with my one finger. I didn't know how that, that structure you see is standing. I don't know, like I, I looked at it like uh, in 2015. It's, it could be, like, it was worse than this picture. But if, if we as if engineers don't pay enough attention, we could be ending up uh, to be in trouble because we didn't look at every uh, location, every corner of these buildings. But it's not the only building we looked at. The pre-engineering building is the simplest building we looked at. And usually, you need to see how many layers of insulation you have underneath, which would tells you pretty much but you will have it pretty much to apply one ply layers and then they put sheets on it. You, we will look at the connection of this one, uh, whether it's a continuous frame or not. Pay very good attention to this type of building because engineers are not looking, they're looking at the purlins. They're getting the dimension of the purlins. They're measuring everything, but something they don't pay attention. They don't look at the overlap of the purlins. This would be your winning solution. How? Because usually in these type of uh, pre-engineering building, the, the winning design is to, to keep repeating it right after. And the purlins, at the joists, sorry, at the main beams, they always require higher moment resistance. So what this company usually does, because they know that the purlin come in a certain length, they design it in a way that it sits on the main beam and the other one slides into it. So when you look at it ultimately, the thickness of your material is double. So sometimes, between two to four feet away from your main beam, this area is doubled, and then later there's only one pillar running. Take it to account for your, uh, for your assessment, because that's how you can get this building works. <coughs> the other buildings, our favorite ones, is the cedar structures, flat roof. Uh, uh, this building is, uh, 80% of our solar systems are installed on these type of buildings. When you go inside the building, you usually need to look at the structures. They usually have the open and seal web joists. You need to measure all of these joists. You need to find out what is the spacing and what is the loading. Usually, these flat roofs, uh, you will find the mechanical and, uh, and electrical equipment that are hanging over the seal. So you need to pay good attention to those ones, have a right uh, load assessment. Sometimes they have a drop ceiling, and um, that load, sometimes people will give up uh, on their quality of their side assessment, they don't consider it. 
um, but that usually at the end of your design, you will see how it drives into your conclusion. But it's really hard to keep track of all of this information. What we would do, we basically recommend to all of our engineers who do the site assessment to prepare a checklist. So what we discuss is actually dense into, into this page here. We talk about the roof, we say what type of roofs we have, what is the, uh, how old is the roof. We ask about the structures, did they have any leaks before, did they, what, is, uh, what is the quality of the roofs at the time. They, uh, because they can cause further problems to, to your design. And also, we, ask, uh, we look for the structure information. Uh, information. We, we measure the column distance, maybe distance, joists, we measure all of those. And at the end of the day, after doing all of those together, we ask for the package, building drawings. As I said, 90% of our buildings does not have any information uh, about their structures, but 110% of this building does not have anything regarding the open book procedures. I can assure you, any building you touch, any building in Ontario, you, you, you point at it, you cannot find the joist description. Canon uh, is the main joist provider in Ontario. Uh, they supplied most of this building in the last 35 years, 40 years. And they did not have that policy to, to release those joist information to the clients. So that's how you find that the, that type of information is missing. Later on, I, I'm not sure uh, because it's been some time that I didn't look at it, but I've heard they're working on the regulation to change it and make it as of the mandatory document to be included as part of the industrial buildings. After we do all of those assessments and measurements, what we would do, we basically need to design a building. This is one of our rooftop assessments. It's actually the first day of Olivier's site visits when he joined our team, we actually went to site to, to look at this one. So, doing the loading assessment, uh, I'm not sure if it's clear or not, we do have the roof profile and the loading. Based on our inspection, we find out what type of uh, roof we have, how many layers we have, and what would be the total loading. We take it to account as a for dead load. We add on top of it for the solar loads, and you can see it, the solar panels that we consider is 5.5 PSF just for the assessment that we do, because most of those racking that we see works for the flat roof, the, the land around like 5 PSF. We add them up, and we, we find the loading calculation. And we, we also define all the different types of the joists we have here for our analysis. Ultimately, when we, we do the assessment, we apply the loading. The reason that I wanted to show the very first slide up here, because based on the code, some people underestimate the codes and they're not reading the open web seat joist requirements. Based on the code, you have to apply a point load. That's the favorite of your design, not against it. People just usually apply the distributed load uh, from one end to another, and that makes your worst design, uh, makes a bad design for you. So the best thing would be to apply right at the nodes, and that's how you can avoid the internal moment that you have from one day to another one here. So, yes? Uh, but based on the code, if that panel is more than two feet, you have to put the distributed load on that? No. If it's more than two feet, as long as your umbrella's length is less than that, you can assume to have a node. But, uh, I can look at the code. There's no terms to address that you have to have a distributed load. If you have it, I would appreciate to share it with me because I haven't seen it. Uh, but uh, you're talking about, uh, I, I may know that which item you're, you're actually addressing. When you have, usually your, your open web C joist is, is, consists of two angles. And they're saying when you have, because when you have these two angles and there are these two nodes, they're more than two feet apart from each other. Right. Then, as far as your design, you need to, I'm not sure if you've seen it, there's small rods they usually put in between of the angle and they're welding it together. That's for that code. So they're saying, as long as you're two feet and less, you don't need it. But if you go beyond that, your, um, your torsion would require you to put one rods in between to just fill up the gap to reduce your requirement of two feet, and then you can keep doing the same thing. This has been done for the massive joist structures. Like, this is a small one. This, we're talking about two feet depth. 
but I'm talking about like four feet, five feet, massive like a joist structures. Same code. Doesn't really change the, the code. The application of the load, the way that you apply the load, doesn't change based on the characteristic of your joist. So it remains the same thing. But in SAP, the only thing that you can do, the umbrella lane, some people, they, they will go less than 0.9, but the code will not allow you to go lower than 0.95. But I've seen in practical areas, some people, they go 0.9. But maybe we can discuss. It's, it's, it's a debateful topic. <laughs> so, jumping in the ground mounts, um, we need to know what type of uh, review we need to do. The first thing that we need to do is the soil and zoning. As I said earlier, the, the ground that you're using for your uh, system, it should be classified between four to seven. MNRF, Ministry of Natural Resources, they do have an open um, map, GIS integrated map, that you would be able to, to locate your property, and it would be able to tell you the soil classification that you can find out which portion of your property you can build your site. And the zoning wise, you need to make sure that you're rural, residential, or you're not an EH or EP or environmental protected land to, to build your system. Uh, that these are the best of work that you basically by contacting the MNRF or contacting the townships and municipalities, they would be able to share this information with you. The next thing uh, you need to do, uh, it's not showing what it's supposed to show, but uh, it's supposed to have a pond or lake right here. <laughs> stuff as you can imagine. That, so that would be for wetland delineation. This is very, very, very important. People will underestimate it. As soon as you want to develop the land, contact CAs, conservation authorities. There's 36 conservation authorities in all over the Ontario that you can simply pick up the phone and call them. They can help you out. And if you don't know who's the uh, CA, call them in order. They can tell you who can help you out on this one. Because if you don't know where you're building it, I have two projects that actually the CA conservation authorities would not allow you even touching the trees or trimming the trees. So imagine if you want to cross the wetland for your road uh, to, to install your system or to, to build it, if, you're not allow, if they're not allowing you to, to go there, how do you want to get there? So they can kill your project instantly. The next thing you need to, to, to check, it would be the site entrance and the road access. So many of the people uh, would need to consider for the road uh, how they need to get from the main street that they're driving on under the public road to their own property. This is a very simple process. Basically, you, by contacting the townships, they would be able to assign you with the civic address and, and a 911 number. Uh, with a small fee, they will let you know uh, how, the, how you need to build your entrance. This is not up to our, us as an engineer, it's up to the township. Any type of requirement comes, they will tell you. Whether you need to put the culvert, whether you need to put the asphalt on, is all their requirements. Sometimes the road that you're getting into the property is not under the jurisdiction of the townships, but it's under the jurisdiction of the county. So you need to understand the level of the government and rules, and if that street doesn't fall into the township, you basically have to go to the county and talk to them. But these due diligence are the simple work, but if you don't do them properly and on time, they can get you in trouble. My favorite topic <laughs> uh, would be the natural features of your property. Um, MNRF is like EPA in the United States. They are very powerful here, the environmental uh, body of the government. They look at it after all of these natural features and they can guide you to do or do not do your job. Or sometimes you have to get the permit. So if you can imagine, this is supposed to be our primary location for solar development. It happens, one of those birds that we, we call logger her trike, it was nesting in 2013 here. And because it was here and somebody happened to pass by and see this nest, they have to have 400 meters set back from this location. Don't underestimate it that there is a different dots here. We have turtles, we have bubbling, 
So for every little dose species, you need to be very careful and see what would be the regulation. Sometimes they don't allow you to build your, your system. Sometimes you need to uh, make up the habitat for these birds and for these species and tell them, okay, they, they used to live here. I give them a house right here. I give them a land. I maintain that land for 20 years. Let them come and, and live there. And then you can build your site. Different solutions that we work around the government uh, with the MNRF, but this is one of the hottest topics that we need to do. And as well as the woodland. Sometimes the area is environmental protected land. Sometimes the area is uh, provincially protected land. The different type of the protection. But you just need to check them one by one and make sure the area you're selecting is suitable. The very last thing that you shouldn't be really concerned about it, but you need to know, is the elevation or topographic of your area. The reason I'm saying that you don't need to be curious about the elevation. All you need to do, whether you're building over a cliff or not, as long as it has a reasonable slope ground, then you can build on it. You may not be able to use all, you don't have the choice of all the racks, but you still have some choice. So the different racks come with different advantages. So you can use the one that works for yours. But to look at the racking and knowing what type of racks we're talking about, I can give you a little bit of introduction of the racks. Yes? Sure. Shall we stop here? I think that's a good spot. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope everybody enjoyed a uh, quick break so, so we may start and continue. Um, so if we can continue with the racking system that we use uh, for our solar projects, again, I should be able to, to categorize it in two projects, like the rooftop and ground. And if I can start with the rooftop, an uh, old-fashioned roof, peach roof. This is the first option that we like to start discuss about it. So mainly, you have two options of connecting your system to the roof. The very first one that's actually into the favorite of most of our systems that we install is the no penetration option. So the reason people don't like to do it is just you have less hassle to, to deal with. So let's say you drill a hole, you need to seal it. And if it leaks, you need to fix it. So if you don't have a penetration that caused those much of problems for you, you, for sure you should take it and you should consider it for your design. So this is very important when you get to your site visits. You need to know if you have a standing seam, sort of metal sheet. You need to know what is it, what is the shape of it, what is the dimension of it. So when you talk to a racking company, they would be able to assist you with the proper clamping option. Because that should be your option one to choose. And basically, this demonstrates the, the way of the installation of these type of the rack. You can see there are four clamps on top, so they will sit right on the flu, uh, uh, the pick of your um, sheets, and they will get tied from both sides together, so they will give you proper tidying, so it doesn't move anywhere. And then once you have your base installed, you can install your rake. It would be your installation for your panel. Uh, respectfully, the next thing would be panels with four clamps and four sides that you need to torque them down, and that would be done. So it's a very fast installation, hassle-free, but you need to know how to deal with these ones. But they're not the only type of the racking that you use for, for the metal roof. You can do the penetration, as always. There's always the option. So but what you can do, basically, is the same sort of terminology, not much of change. But what you need to do, instead of having a clamp that sits on it and, and torque it, what you need to do, you need to put the plate or something to, to make a hole going down and tie it that way, and then later on you can run your rate. Most of the time, when you get your penetration, when the landlord would allow you to make a penetration right here, you should start thinking of making a good site. Why? Because this option is costly. So let's say somebody has a drill, needs to sit every, for every spot, they need to drill twice. So imagine if you have a 500 kilowatt, you basically are dealing with 1800 modules. And if you have 1800 modules, you pretty much need to make a thousand time holes. So mul multiply by two is going to be 2000. And if each one would take you only one minute to do it, it would take you 2000 minutes to do it. So it would be costly, right? So if you want to do it, do it right. How we do it right? You will see we are introducing new members. Why? Because we want to increase the tilt. Always consider the higher tilt, the higher production. 
but it doesn't mean when you go higher you can build your site. Sometimes you have different restrictions, you cannot build it. But if you have the option to do it, always take it. Because that would give you a better return. But truth, I don't like it. It's ugly. But if you want to sell it, you can sell it. Uh, so what about the snow accumulation? So good question. When you have a tilt, we actually had that like discussion during the breaks too. So let's say your panel would get uh, fed up with the snow. You just cover it like two inch of the snow. There's no tiny uh, bit of sunlight to get to your panel. You don't generate any. But as soon as a corner, like the smallest spot of your panel, gets opens up to sunlight, that tiny portion would try to start generating electricity. How? Because it gets sunlight, it's dark. The surface of all of these modules is dark. And we all know based on the 101 physics that uh, when you get light, you, get, you, you disperse heat. Right? So as soon as they start causing a heat here, that will get expanded slightly through the whole panel. And at one point, it, uh, the snow would start to slide off. But it's not going to run off from the panel. It would just get accommodated right here right between the frame and between your actual solar, solar modules that you have. It can cause a huge trouble for you if the paneling and the insulation is not proper, the water will go in between, it will frost, and the next year you will come in, then you will see that it just D-shaped and that you have to remove the whole thing and bring the new one. That's actually one of our biggest concerns when we go to Huntsville area. Um, I'm not sure if you've been in that area, they have a severe winter. When we design a system, we usually put the gutter around it and make sure that it's not uh, going to let anything happen to it. But I have seen many, many installations. We actually get to that point, I will show a lot of the slides to you, that if you don't do a proper engineering, you have a severe consequence to face. Uh, but not many engineers are paying enough attention to those ones. So, the first thing that I want to, for you to look at is the shape of these foods. I just want to go back to the previous one. Uh, I went too far. This is the standing seat. You can see the hip here is tiny, they're tight, they're really dense together. But you, what you will see here is opened up, it's like a V-shape open. They don't have any clamping option for this one. Not that I have seen it in Canada, in the States. To give you inside information, there's only one company in North America who made clamps, believe it or not. Like all of these second companies, they're buying from that company. Like literally, they're really putting all of their um, effort and money into those clamping to the extent that nobody else dared to go to design a clamp because they have everything for you. So these guys are like really lazy, dumb people. Like when, you, when they look at the, the clamping option, if they don't have that they don't have it from the company, they say we don't have any company option. But it doesn't mean there's no option. There's always the option for us as of engineers to design a system. But let's go on the flat roofing. On the flat roof, I can categorize them to two major categories, footprint system. The footprint system, if you can imagine you have a leg, like an L-shaped bracket, it only sits at the corner of your module. What does it do is that you have less material to supply. And for many of you to look at it, you may have noticed these small blocks. This is a no penetration solution. As I said, most of our landlords, and I would say 100% of them, they don't like to, turn it to, to make a hole to their buildings. So they want you to get off from it, not to cause any mechanical connection with the system. So that's how we design it. I think we go back to your question, and that's how the, the ballast would be designed for each building. <clears throat> so if you want to look at the profile of this one, you can see that this is like a C-channel extended uh, arms. Uh, and on one side, they're longer because they sit in the back of the panel for clamping. On the other hand, they're much lighter, uh, smaller and shorter, and they will sit right in the bottom of the panel. And they would get clamped on both ends to it. So at the final uh, look of the system, when you look at it, it's nice and neat, everything is tied together. 
The advantage of this system, especially if you will not do a proper engineering, as I said, you need to find your obstruction of the roof and you need to locate them. But if you not, do not do a good job, if you're not confident for your top of surveys that you have done, go with this option because it, it's module oriented. So if it happens that you get the vents just popping up right here and you didn't notice it, all you need to do, just take this one off, move it somewhere that you have a space. And the racking company can accommodate for that one. The only thing that it changes is this ballast requirement. You may need to, to buy a couple more gloves to just put it here, but as far as getting your job done, it's doable. Are they heavy those blocks? Sorry? Those blocks are not heavy? Uh, well, yes, they are. So, especially these ones, they're coming in 25 pounds. And um, sometimes, you need to repeat the same block five times. So you can imagine, or two or three, you put them on top of each other. So they're just sitting on top of the ground. Exactly. They're just resting on top. So there are different methods about designing this one. Some of them, they sit aside, but they're having bracket underneath. Some, some of them, they're directly sitting on top of it. But, but they always have a ballast resting on top of the rack. That was not the only one. The next type of the racks that we have, they call it ray-based rack. So imagine instead of introducing your legs, you run two uh, members from one side to another and you tie them all together, like one single piece. This is the structure that sounds, and I'm in favor of these racks, I would say 100%. But you need to always make sure you have a proper, proper survey of the area of your roof. Otherwise, if you don't do a good job, or if you don't know what would be the potential future development of the landlord, because sometimes they don't put the rents right there or the HVAC, but two years down the road they change the tenant and all the way all of a sudden they want to put the uh, make it like one HVAC unit. What would you do with it? So this type of rack doesn't help you, but the other one it does. For this one, you need to have a crystal clear discussion with the landlord, crystal clear discussion with the system owner, so you know they're looking for this one. And once you put it on, you can close your eyes and it's, nothing's going to happen to these type of racks. But that was only for the rooftops. For the ground mounts, I can categorize into three categories. The first one is a fixed system. What is that mean? The module is fixed, installed on the rack. So the fixed system can be two ways, mono and it can be dual. Mono means they have only one post. Dual, it has two posts. When you do mono, you are only limited to so much of the panel to, to stack them right beside each other and repeat them after, right? So in these types, you won't, we call it too high or too portrait. So you can only put two modules ideally here to install it. And each module can be two meters length. So you can imagine this length could be four meters in total. And that's how it would be the system. This is landscape. So the width of each module you see here, it represents one meter. So, but if you turn the module, it would be one by two, then you will see that you only can repeat two modules here. But on the dual uh, racking, you can have more options. Like you can sometimes repeat six modules. You can repeat them like a landscape six times, seven times, and you can have a bigger table. But when it comes to the installation, you always take it to account for your labor, for your equipment, for your rental equipment and the stuff that you need to bring to the site. So sometimes it's not a really good idea to make it as big as you want. Sometimes it's better to make it a small, something doable for, for repeating purpose. We basically call it, uh, call it as a cookie cutter because the people who install it on site, they don't want to think. They just want to have it in their hands and close their eyes and make sure even if they close their eyes, the chance of making a mistake is zero. So counting to those, and it doesn't really let you to, to make this one crazy big. What's the average height? The average height? Uh, that's a really good question. Usually we don't talk about the average height. We, we talk about the lowest uh, height of your front panel. Why are we talking about it? Because it really depends on your natural characteristic of your site and the area you're developing. For example, if I make this one in California, uh, I just make it maybe a foot above the ground. I don't need to make it anymore. But if I make it in all here in Ontario, I, I need to at least give four feet to it. It's for a snow accommodation because it snows too much. You're in the farm, you're in the suburb area, so 
the, the, the potential of getting more snow is much higher. And they will accommodate at the bottom here. At one point, you will see that you have a pile of snow in front of your panel, and they're not letting you to generate anything. So it is very important to introduce your minimum height of the front of your panel. But everything else would be followed. Uh, whether you have 10 degree tilt, 20 degree tilt, everything would fall. But this is the very first thing you need to introduce. But if you move from the face, we have a single axis tracker. What does this type of the tracker does? They would be able to rotate in one axis. The good thing about this system, it would be you have a higher income potential of your generation. Rules of thumb of this system is that your production would be increased by 13 to 15 percent compared to the fixed system. But respectfully, you need to introduce more materials. This is, this is the actuators that you can imagine that it rotates that hefty beam right here, including 144 modules together, all the way up from, if I can tell you, this should be around like uh, 70 degrees, 60 to minus 60 degrees. So turning everything together, it, it requires a very massive uh, engine right here. And that would be our concerns for the operation and maintenance in future for 20 years. But as far as the production goes, these are perfect. They can give you a very good income. Even though the new um, rates that has been introduced through feed contracts, these are works the best. But we have a dual tracker too. The dual tracker system, not many companies in the world are making these types. There, there are few selected companies. There are usually state companies that do that. But as you can see, it, this particular type of the dual tracker system, it has four legs. On top of every one of these legs here, you have an actuator that can rotate from sun uh, rise to the sunset for you, and it can maximize your observation of the sunlight, and you would have the highest production with this one. It can be, if I'm not mistaken, between 25 to 27 percent increase in production should be expected from this type of the racking compared to the fixed system. But I'm, a, I'm one of the people who's against this type of the racks. The issue is, if you, right, how many civil engineers do we have here? Perfect. You can, the very first reason that we don't like it is just because the cut and fill of this type of the racks is massive. You should make sure that four of the legs, just imagine these ones, these legs, they're almost about 10 meters apart from each other, sorry, five meters apart from each other. So you should have a steady ground elevation that it gives you the exact same pipe in, in four corners. Imagine how bad you can get it in the farm to build it like that, to be able to have a proper installation. So for that simple reason, and simply the cost that we have to pay for the rack, uh, this is not there yet to, to be feasible for the system. But I have seen developers that are eagerly looking at this type of a dual tracker because they're obsessed with the name. Do they just sit on the ground or do they have piles? They do usually have pipes. So these type of ma uh, massive structures that you're looking at, this is actually one of the sites that we went for to just see what a good job we can do with this type of the system. And all, honestly, they did a very, 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 very good installation. But every other year, they need to do the retrofit projects because, because of the frost heat problem. So it, they get desaligned. And every year, they should have to send the crew right there, pay 2500 just to fix them. But they, those people who paid for this track, they didn't account for the retrofit projects. How many times they need to repeat that job? So let's say we all know what type of racks we have, but what, what type of foundation do we need to deal with? Usually we have six different types of foundation we consider for our system. Driven posts, um, fast, cheap, Everybody likes to do it, but it's not a really good option in, in, in Ontario, all the locations. You may be able to use it based on the friction factor you get and the profile of those pipes, you may or may not be able to use it. Throughout the post, 
is the end the story of this type of the pipes because most of the time the drill they, they find out the underground it has different conditions they end up filling it up with the concrete and say okay I have a dead man anchor at the bottom so always get or there is two more options that recently has been introduced maybe three to four years at most like I'm not sure what is uh, what is their history but this helicopter is actually one of the very good ones that we use for most of our system if the underground condition will allow us. If the geotech we do, and the result we see, uh, it doesn't really give us uh, much of the cobbles or, or the reef traps that uh, we need to deal with, or the bedrock is not really to the surface, which is the case in, in most of the Kingston area, then we can use this type. Or, if we have a ground with a similar condition, much, a little bit rougher, we can use the ground screws. This is also a good option that we can use, but not many companies nowadays, they give us a good uh, driving screws for the solar, with a good price. They, they're usually extensive. So we end up using Helica or Deadman Anchor or Rock Socket, if we have a bedrock, to use for a system. I, I may uh, have raised this question perhaps for, for the other presentation that I joined. Um, you have a landfill. Um, when you have a landfill, pretty much the type of the foundation that you can use is no penetration. And you either have a pre-place or pre-cast type of foundation. It's a very messy work. I haven't seen one single contractor to do a proper job to, to do this type of foundation. But if you're out of option and you cannot really penetrate through the ground, then basically these are the two options that you need to consider. Based on the cost of the country that you need to buy, whether you're um, Lafarge supplier office would be somewhere close to your uh, building, or perhaps you need to find a local contractor. But are they suitable in Canada because, because of the heat? They are they're very suitable for the area, but uh, you need to design for the frost here. And then you need to, because the way that you design this one, you need to consider as if the floating deck. So in the floating deck, you, you have no foundation going under the ground, and then you need to extend your uh, insulation. Uh, per every feet you're not going under, you have to extend it at the side. So imagine if this is 2 feet by 10 feet long, you need to introduce a sheet by 18 feet by 10 feet to make sure that you have a proper installation for your uh, uh, frost heat. And then you compact it, and then you can put this one on top. Because of all of those concerns, these are not really adding up up here. We do use this type of foundation in, in the States, where we actually have do, we do have landfill in New York that we are considering to use this one, but we are considering a much lighter version of this one. These are very hefty, and we can't really apply that such a concentrated load in one spot of the landfill. It would just cause too much of trouble because of their settlement. So these are not the only type of engineering we do. There's still different sort of disciplines that we have to go through. So usually for our civil engineering, we need to, to consider rule 101, cut and fit, optimize, like make sure your cut and fit is at the bare minimum. So the good thing of our design is that our cut and fit is pretty much at zero. Every time we design our system, we, we copy the same elevation and we're not disturbing the elevation. That's our goal, that's our key to design our system. And that's how we can build these so many different you know, systems. For the road that we need to buy, we may or may not need to have a light um, uh, cut, just because of having the top soil. That's, that's what I would consider as the bare minimum that you need to do for your cut. But nothing more than that. So even though the, if, the, if you don't have the severe drop in, in your elevation, and you have to you know, make up for it, then basically we don't touch it much. Uh, we remove the top soil, we put our um, base, sub base, we compact it, we put our base and we all set. And maybe I need to mention that one into bracket. The level of the standards that we design, it does not require to be as part of the OPSC requirements. It's not uh, Ontario regulation because it is inside the owner property. So we build it up to his satisfaction, not to the government satisfaction. Sometimes we need to introduce or uh, we need to have a much less width 
sometimes we need to have a, a higher quality of the road. This is something that actually the landlord would be able to influence us in our designs, not the government and the code and regulation. But this portion, only this portion, we have to follow the regulation of OPSC because the township would, allow, would ask us to follow that. And we usually have the extra down payment for, to the townships that if we don't follow those requirements, then they don't release those payments to us. The next thing that we need to do uh, is it would be for stormwater management. The stormwater management, as you may all know, like uh, we just need to make sure that the water will keep uh, going the same direction as it used to be in past. Uh, this may be a very light version of definition of the stormwater management. So in, in the way that we design, we actually don't disturb. So there's no stormwater management design for it. Unless, unless we need to introduce a dam. Unless the area gets flooded. Uh, I, I had the property in, in the Stormy's area. I'm not sure if you guys are, are familiar with the area. Only four inch under the subsurface. Um, so what we would do on those ones is basically what kind of stormwater management you can do in the winter and the spring and um, in the spring time. You would see. Is anybody is familiar with the Kettle Lake? Have you heard of that? Oh, sorry. Have, are you guys familiar with the Kettle Lake? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's pretty much a problem getting a Kettle Lake every year and summertime it won't dry so and it's the bedrock there so because you have a cracks in between of the bedrocks so the water would slowly pass through by next time so we need to take it to account in our design to make sure it's not going to get flooded so the storm water management per se may not be needed but for the sake of your system you may need to apply to make sure that the frost heave and all of those facts are not ruining your site so sometimes you need to take, uh, take it close attention to this one. And the road design, well, uh, not much to, to be said, but this, is, this would show you the typical design of the axis road. Uh, most of the cases, because right beside your road you have a ditch, um, there's, a, there's a likelihood of uh, needing a culvert. But you can simply, by looking at the ditch, you can say whether the, the, the culvert would need it or not, but we are not in a position to design for that as well. Uh, we always ask the township to, to direct us with these requirements. But the width, you can see like it's six meters, like it's 20 feet, it's, it's pretty standard. The OPSC's requirement, the southern base and all of those, but we don't really follow that requirement. We reduce it, you can reduce it to 16 feet for the flatbed trailer. You cannot reduce it anymore because the width of the trailer will limit you, but you cannot reduce it. But the turning radius, you need to pay attention because the inner radius is 52 feet and the outer radius is 77 feet. So if you're reducing your road, you need to make sure the turning radius that you introduce, it gives you enough buffer to turn safely. The next design, which we're all familiar with OPSD's requirement, that would be the fence design. Nobody invent this design, we always refer back to the code and we always follow the same installation. Uh, something that you don't see here is a barbed wire. So the barbed wire is, is not mandatory to be installed in every site, it's for the sake of security. So if you feel that the area, you have a theft problem and you have to make sure that it's safe for you and you don't allow anybody to just jump over it and turn off your system, sometimes they, they put one there. But ideally we don't put any because usually they have a calm neighborhood when you go to a separate area and they're all nice. So, something that we need to do, it would be geotechnical foundation design, communication power, usually screen. These are really important, but the geotech is the very, very first one. And the, the most uncertain research that you can do is this one. As much as you do a good job, you always get disappointed. I can't tell you how many times we did the geotech, we did the test tape, we did the boho, but we end up finding something else. We literally find the river under the bedrock. Like, literally, like we couldn't really do anything to it. But we couldn't really see it for the geotech. But geotech gives you the good understanding. As far as it doesn't give you all the, the complete view to your underground, 
at least it gives you where is the water table, what is the underground expected underground condition. So you can plan for it, but always plan for worst case scenario. Always be ready. My personal experience, you go to the site, you want to do the installation, it never counts in this one. 20% of your pipes should be various different type of pipes. You should have it with you. If the first one doesn't work, use a new one. And there should be close uh, connection between the installers and between uh, the designers because this drilling and in installation of the pipes, it, it's really, really tricky. And if you don't closely look at the contractors, they can cheat their work easy. And the foundation design, we, we, I think we recalled it like earlier, like we know what type of foundation we need to do, but two interesting topics would be for the communication tower and visual screen. Communication tower is not the requirement in our design, but Pony, which is a Hydro One uh, utility, they sometimes they ask us, to have a proper rapid shutdown between our side because it's a really utility scale one. They need to have a control with the side. So if they catch fire, if anything happens, God forbid, like anything happens, they would be able to remotely disconnect the whole system. So sometimes the tower would be required based on those connections and detail. But the very interesting topic that I used to like to talk to the landscape architectures is the visual screening. This is a new regulation introduced from FIT for 2015 that everywhere that you build your site, you need to make sure that the people, the um, public who pass by, they don't get disturbed by your system. So as a requirement, we need to introduce the natural habitat that we have there and basically replant the trees to make sure by the time when they grow mature, nobody see the uh, solar panel. But at the same time, they're not causing the shading on your panel. This is a new regulation. I'm, I'm in favor of this one because I have seen they have, you may have seen it, but uh, driving through the corridor 401 toward east, you see there are some massive like, solar projects that like, they don't even have fence around it, but there are millions of those being repeated. And you can imagine how much people are getting disturbed by looking at those ones and getting to the car crash for that simple reason they don't want to have it. When we get to the construction of these sites, you always need to have a level of control over the installation. And every time, every single time, when, we, when you do the closing and commissioning, you need to make sure and check for every single thing, even if it's not in your scope of work. But as long as you know it is a deficiency, you need to listen. So if you look at this sort of checklist that I actually prepared this one for my team to, to, to fill it up every time, is that they need to check the setback, they need to check for the sacrificial layer, every single thing that even though we didn't really discuss it, we didn't do anything about it. But those little things could cause problems. If you are looking after the goodness of our solar system owners, we need to treat them respectfully and honestly, and therefore, our checklist needs to be properly prepared. You need to always document your inspection. Nobody takes your word. As much as you're trustworthy, <laughs> you step out of your office, nobody will trust you. But when you take pictures and evidence it, then nobody has any ground to say it's otherwise. So always take pictures, always mark the issues with your drawing, show uh, where the deficiencies are, and then basically you're safe. As an engineer, you already have uh, done a good job and there's no need to, to do anything else. But just to share a little bit of history, we got a little bit of um, guests to our site. We got lots of cattle. <laughs> we never accounted for cattle. Like, they're, they're literally in the middle of the farm. They're not allowing us to install anything. It's, it's their farm. Like, they came here, but so in every site you need to keep every individual or any animal that is not belonging to your site, keep them out of site. Because you can hit them, you can put yourself in danger, you can put others in danger. So pay close attention. In the construction of the sites, very common issue. This, this is actually the area would be a kettle lake in future. Like it's actually uh, adding up a little by little to the contractor that we asked them to, to put the pump right here to suck out all the waters and make sure the, the area stands, they didn't do it. And after two months, they didn't do the racking. 
three of those posts collapse. Because one of the posts that was sitting, as I said, we didn't know we have a river underneath of the bedrock. So I don't know how the water was just rising in elevation, but it was just getting into the two of these piles and they were washing the, the soil around them. So it just faded after two months. So we had to, they had to do, redo the job. I'm not gonna say the name of the company, everybody knows. That. <coughs> this is another failure to their side. Can you tell me what is wrong with this one? They're building a road. But obviously they're not removing the topsoil. It's not our smart way of designing this. <laughs> they did a, a good job of removing the topsoil. So this road, if, if we keep using this road, I can expect every single year we have to maintain it. Every single year you need to add a little bit of gravel on top of it, drive a couple of tides on it to, to make it work. But people are still driving and making one. So I can't believe how people can do it. And the foundation, I just want to show a little bit of this clip if I can play it. Uh, just reverse in a way. It's not supposed to, but uh, as you can imagine, there's the auger here, the operating to make a hole is a bit wide. This auger broke three times. Uh, we had to we end up bringing a new one from Saskatoon. So later, after we do the pile installation, uh, as of the true con control, uh, quality control, we need to do a pull up test. So there's two tests that we do lateral forcing, pull up test. We don't usually do the lateral because it's not really our intention to do so. It's not the function of this type of pile to, to help us out, but the pull up would be. This is not the destructive test. This is the service load test. So what we would do, we just put it up to the service load. If it's good, we leave it as is. But if it broke, it means that's not a good installation. We only, in the 500 kilowatt system, we ideally have between 196 to 212 piles, uh, depending on the different type of racks. But we only test five of those, at most. Like, even if they have enough money, they're not gonna do anything more than five. Uh, but what we would do as a for quality control measurement, we always keep record of these drills all the time, uh, record and check it to see what, what is being recorded on the contractor's list, the documents, and we make sure they have a proper documentation. This is another picture to show as much as we do a good job, we can always get disappointed. The bedrock that we test for this spot was only four inch under the ground, so it means uh, bedrock sounds four inch on the ground offset but this one we drill for 2.54 meters under the ground and you can see all the way down is a winner it, there's no hope there, there was no record of further bedrock at all no more than like six inches in, into a geotape result but you can see how that result could disappoint you but I think it's enough is enough we can look at the failures of the engineers as of like closing this session. So, so, so what is your pull-up test service for? Is it due to the heat or the rain? So the we designed for heat, but service law would be the combination of your wind, dead, and live loads. And whatever the loading uh, pull up. So the net is a pull? So what we do, yes. So we, come, uh, we calculate the loading, what would the combined loading pressure that applies in the area. And when we do the pull-up test, we pull it to that degree. So your design may take more loads, but we don't need it. No, I mean, no. what is the... You need the numbers? Load, what is the cause of that uh, pull? You mean, sorry, I'm not... Do you mean what is that um, capacity that helps to resist? Where, 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 the source is the wind and the seismic and all the other yeah, is, is the load combined loading. Yeah. Is, is the combination of what you have, like as of the mechanical, as of the dead load, and what will come potentially from wind and so uh, and, and so on and all those. And seismic loads perhaps. So you don't test it for compression? No, no, you don't need to test it for compression. Your, your member should, should uh, take the load for the compression, but the foundation should be uh, tested against pull-up. So 
Big of, A, which uplift. is uplift, exactly, uplift. So you can see that this is one of the examples of the project. There was a thunderstorm, don't take it wrong. The engineering was okay. But the structure that they did install their systems on it, it was not a good structure. They didn't do a good analysis or they didn't do a proper reinforcement of this one. Otherwise, it's easy to deal with. So this is not a picture you can see. It's just, they might get some money for it for this aluminum, but nothing more that they can make from these systems. This is another system. It's a shingle. You can see that the installation is okay, like the roof is intact, no problem. But you see it's folded over. Uh, it clearly shows the clamping that they introduced to connect the rack to the roof was not properly done or designed. So we can't say certainly, but that's obviously caused from that. This is another example. This system should be a ballasted system, meaning no penetration option. So obviously, if you don't do a good design, these are will fly around. We had one in here, we called it microburst incident. It was actually my design. <laughs> Nothing bad against it, but I didn't take to account for the future development. Uh, I think we discussed that topic. I think Hamid brought it up. Uh, it's a huge, massive warehouse in Scarborough, uh, near to um, Central, I forgot the, the mall in, in Scarborough, but right beside it, they built two high rises. And those high rises, they are about like 100 meters apart from our building, but they are long enough that they make a thunderstorm in the area locally. And a couple of our panels did, did, did fly around and they caused uh, some damage for us, so we had to fix them. So we should take it down for those ones. But sir to God, at the time we built it, there was no building there. So, <laughs> Uh, it, it's not our problem sometimes to, to see this development, but we need to pay good attention to address those issues right away to make sure nothing will happen to the other to their cities. So going back to this incident, this is obviously lack of introducing enough ballast to the system, and that could cause um, a lot of issues and losses for you. Can you tell me what would be this issue? Can, can anybody move. can tell me? It's moved, but why? If, if you didn't catch it, if you look at the footprint, it seems like this whole ray completely moved for about like one meter. When you design for your wind load, there is a check mark, it is a due diligence check by the handbook that you need to design for sliding factor. You just need to say this design has been completed this item, all good. But I can tell you 50% of our engineers, uh, they don't count for this one. Yes, Correct. for sliding, exactly. Sometimes they consider they do a good job, but they're not fitted with the proper information. This is a typical uh, roof development. What, what does that mean? When you have a build-up roof, it past the, the age of 13 to 15 years, you don't go back to rebuild. You don't rip it up, but what you would do you will put one of those TP, uh, TPO PVCs layer, those one ply membrane, which is white, just to allow to, to seal the roof for you, and then you, you can put your panels. These are warranted for 20 to 35 years, but in their warranties, they have been told many times there should not be any mechanical connection between the roof membrane and any other mechanical object. So if you put your panel here, you can see there is a really small black layer installation underneath here. This is mainly is provided by the wrapping company, but even though if you put this one, they will violate the warranty and they will uh, revoke it. But what, we, what you need to do, you need to buy, that's the reason, you need to pay. You buy the same sheets from the folks, you cut them in pieces that can't sit underneath, you apply that one first, and then you put your wrap then they have no ground to tell you that you are violated their warranties and they cannot say anything. They have to come back and fix it. Trust me, they are running away from us. We don't like this at all because we cause them a lot of problems. But this one also is, uh, this sort of sliding design uh, 
could be a huge concern if you design it for a cave stand because you have a seismic load. Uh, there is a solution. Um, there is a company called S5 Clamp. Look into it. They do have some sort of a clamp. They call it peel and stick clamp. If I can go back to this one. It's the same material uh, with their very really strong adhesives. They, they put the flies underneath. They stick it to this one. It's as strong as welding. So no problem. You, you can choose two or three of those ones here. We just hold the whole system down. But you need to make sure that it's not too much because it will rip off your food. So <laughs> there's always balance going to me all the time. This is another picture that you can see how bad it could end up if, if you don't do a proper installation or slash design. And this would be a rich. There's a lot of missing panel here. So the rack is sitting, no problem. But the racks, uh, but the panels are not here. They've been flying around and they've been damaging these panels, you can see. The clamp that these installers did install, they, do, they didn't do a good job. They were loose. Usually, after you do an installation, you trick it down, you need to mark it. You need to come, usually the supervisor will come after the installers to check it. If the torquing is proper, it will just, if the market will just mark it and it's just confirmed. But I can assure you they didn't do this one here. Uh, this is another case. The rack is intact, but they had one flying around and it started causing different problems. This one <laughs> is one of the best examples ever. Over torquing your connections, it can rip off your connection. So that's, that's an A plus. These guys did a great job by avoiding the cut and fill, you can see. But something they're not considering, they should just go on the rack. Eight feet above the ground to install it. This is violating the code by itself in Canada. This is not a Canadian project by itself. This is not. But obviously, it shows the wrong practice of doing the installation and workmanship on these projects. And usually, these type of posts, uh, can you tell me what would fail these posts? A slenderness ratio, exactly. The capacity won't kill it, the slenderness ratio will kill it. Exactly, but they, they introduce this brace right here, but that brace should be continued toward the end, unless it's not good. You got the other direction. Well, if you, if you stick it in one plane and you can assume that the connection is rigid, then you can act like a cantilever design, and then you can say that can stand by itself, but you're absolutely right. So as it goes beyond, if this post gets much higher, then it cannot really continue the installation. So I'm hoping till now and till my here, you, you got a little bit of taste about the solar industry, the challenges we're facing in our installation. But what I'd like to do, I'd like to leave it up here and then see if you have any questions for me to, to address. Thank you. So you missed the first part. So how long have you been in the industry? Well, I, I would say day one in Ontario. <laughs> uh, how long I started in 2010. Okay. Uh, at the time, I was in Ryerson University, but as of a, like a volunteer job, I, I was really interested in renewable energy. I started uh, researching on CHPs, like uh, uh, what they call it, uh, concentrated heat, uh, if I may. Uh, solar, wind, uh, to learn a, bit, a little bit more. By the time I got graduated, by the way, I got the opportunity to join solar, and I've been working for like six six years. And what's the average growth rate in the last six years in Ontario and in Canada? It's, it's skyrocketing. Yeah, and at the same it. time, uh, that is skyrocketing, at the same time, it, it collapses and goes down. The reason that I'm saying there's a lot of good new companies, they grow too quick, too fast, they can't keep up, and they, they burn. Uh, I can, if I can speak of a uh, number of the companies, you may have heard of those like Eaton, 
is, is one of the biggest name in the world. They see supply are disconnects. They've been in, in solar, but they gave up. In Hamilton utility, they've been in solar, they gave up. Uh, Sun Edison, they're, really, they're pretty big. I'm not sure if those um, names ring the bell or not, but these folks were the big players in 2010. Sun Edison installed 110 megawatt system in 2010. There was no such a contract. There were only three projects built at the time with at the rate of 80.2. So you already know the sense of calculation. If you do the calculation, you, you can get what would be the income of these people. A small fee for one projects, they are making quarter million dollar every year. Just simple, like turn back. It's a great industry, it's new, it's, it's, it's learning. Uh, we are introducing a lot of new materials. Uh, that's how we are getting cheaper and cheaper. Not to say cheaper in quality, but good in quality, keep maintaining the same quality, but making it better in terms of the insulation, in terms of the return on all this. If I may ask one more. Oh, absolutely. The proportion of the cost of the panels versus the installation, I guess the uh, just. Yeah, I remember a day in 2010. You you, sh you could buy a panel for dollar and ten per watt. So uh, imagine if you had the 300 watt system, the 300 watt panel, you more or less have to pay like 300 bucks for it. Nowadays, you can buy a panel for not on the special rates, uh, like um, foreclosure sort of uh, sales, but in a normal routine market, is around right now 54 to 52 cents per watt. But if you have a mass volume purchase, there's always a bargaining power comes with it, right? But uh, the big players, they're always in, in states. Uh, there's a few good ones up here, like Canadian Solar is one of the very, very good module providers. I think we should have an office in Iran as well. I, I've, I've seen their name. Uh, I didn't have the chance to meet with them, but I've seen their names there. Uh, yes, that's all. Like, I mean, like, there are some Korean, Chinese, but they're all smart. They, they, they're all made in China, at the end of the day. But they're Canadian made, why? Because they bring those um, black sheets to Canada, they, they extrude the frame because aluminum is pretty cheap here, they frame it and they say, made in Canada. So, so what, what are the panels made of? Uh, silicon. Yes. Yes. So it does work if you start a new startup in solar installation. Sorry, I didn't hear. So it does work if you uh, start a new startup company. To it does. If you do a good startup, literally you don't need to spend a penny on it. And starting with from zero, right? No penny. That's what I'm saying. Zero uh, information. Well, zero information, you start getting information. There's a lot of uh, mm. available information you can get. And, and if you go through the government websites, they always have a useful resource of information. You can, well, nowadays, if you Google it, like how can I install a solar? Like in five minutes, there's tens of thousands of the website that you can tell like how to install it for your house. Do it yourself. Uh, but if you want to start up a company, um, there's actually this moment of the year uh, you will remember this moment. After January this year, uh, there will be a new program would be introduced through ISOs with the new incentives uh, that you can use and introduce your solar programs. It's not gonna be the same as you, what you see, like a fee program that you, you sign a contract with the government, 20 years done. No, uh, it's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, I can't really speak of it yet because uh, they haven't announced it. I know a bit, but uh, I would rather to wait till the, the regulations is out. Yes, yes. Um, the reason is the fit contract was was very really good and um, enthusiastic for the developers, but net metering uh, is not. So uh, the actual market tar target market was to to get the landlords, but because it's not really very really successful nowadays, 
when people don't have that knowledge of background, it's not really that simple like fee contract to calculate. So uh, people are kind of hesitant. So government noticed that and they are changing the regulation to January and right before the election. So then uh, there, is, there would be a new incentive will kick in like feet, but it's not feet. And then you can have your contract. But even right now to address your question, um, I said this earlier, like two minutes ago, like big players are out because they cannot keep up. Usually when you have a small company, your, your manual capability is much higher than the big companies. You have overburden costs every month for, for your fixed costs that you have to pay. Right now, we, uh, we work with SNC Lavalin, we compete with each other for, for the installation. They never ever can keep up with us because the unit rate of their installation is minimum 45% more than us. But we are keep maintaining a group in like a individual teams, we keep them aside and then we, we maintain them in a way that they're not causing any cost. And when we use them, we, they actually turn to be much cheaper. So why do you say you, you, you can set up a new company? I didn't say you can't, you can. You, no, you say that you can do it with uh, no capital cost. Yes, you can do it at no capital cost at all. Uh, maybe hundred bucks at most you need to pay. Like, uh, assume that your corporation is registered, you, need to, you don't need to pay for it. Uh, as long as you have a right strategy, you, you know what market you're tackling into, who's your target market, there's no problem. Like, at least I don't see any problem. Like, maybe I'm wrong. How long did it take for you, uh, if you don't mind, to uh, reach the point from the time that you started to work in this field and the, to the time that you felt like, okay, I'm, I'm cool and I'm, 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 I can handle my life. Never. <laughs> Maybe the right answer is never. Because you always learn. So let's say, how long did it take for so you to get to your first You, you want an honest answer? I want to give you an honest answer. When I joined the, to the solar industry, for the first week, I didn't know anything. We went for a, ma for a meeting, engineering meeting, and the VP of our company we were talking to, uh, he came and started talking. He was an electrical engineer. He says, I don't give you. Sorry, my language. I don't give a damn whether you, you, you know or you don't know how to get the job done. But I, all I do care, I want you to know where to go to get that answer. So as long as you, nobody has any solid answer to your questions, none of those topics, I can clearly point at each, every one of those topics and nobody can tell you that they know everything. But to know enough, uh, it probably takes, I don't know, like uh, Olivier, this guy that who came, he actually joined my team and he's one of the fast learners ever I've seen. Like his, his IQ is pretty high. He could get the stuff in like, he got them in, in six months or eight years. And he could just do the job himself with the minimum supervision, not no supervision, but minimum. What about electrical knowledge? Much electrical knowledge you have uh, <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit more than zero because <laughs> uh, my main background comes from the structure uh, I, I know everything about the steel I know not everything but I know more than I know about electrical uh, through the course of um, I should say I'm electrical engineer by trade <laughs> I just learned through uh, doing these designs interacting with the electrical engineers I have built more than uh, 150 rooftop projects. Uh, I have uh, assessed more than minimum 180 buildings. Uh, I have built more than like 20 to 30 like uh, ground mounts, and I'm building 180 ground mounts for in next uh, year and a half. Um, I didn't introduce our company, but our company is the biggest developer in Ontario. 50% of the market share is ours. Do you have a business card being Yes, sir. Sorry, can I? Oh, of course. Sorry, no. So, 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 so
So you should be thinking uh, a little bit uh, upfront for building those sites, how you need to design them, how you need to do the engineering and all of those. So a little bit of stuff talking to, to the contractors to talk about the disconnect AC panel board. Uh, I stand by it, I see it's just, it looks like my panel in my house. And it's it's so just much bigger. Do you have preferred contractors? Or? Uh, we don't have, well yes, we have a qualified contractors. Like, uh, we don't blindly accept people's proposal to, to build the system. Uh, they should have a bankable reputation. And uh, it, it happens we get a lot of proposals, we end up not giving not one single job to them. Uh, lately, our main contractor that we, we end up selecting for these sites was uh, Panasonic. You may have heard of them, and I'm not sure if you're uh, familiar with their solar or energy development. They are, they are fully like a GC sort of contractors that, that, that install those sites for us most of the time, not all. So are they full-fledged uh, contractors? They do no. the groundwork, the structure? No. no. Uh, well, maybe if you were if you were talking like four years ago, three years ago, there was opportunity. Um, at the time when uh, companies start building up, they start hiring people and training them. By the time they went down, those people got fired. They lost their job, and then they started looking for a job. As as we got along with these few contracts from two thousand and ten. I can tell a lot of big names and small names, they went down and those people were, were looking for market. I had people literally coming from France to our team, like uh, one of my team members actually came up from France. So those companies, when they uh, let their uh, resources go, they usually start looking for the different company. So when we end up selecting these people, we would rather just select the ones who has like related experience, not the one that they're starting fresh as far as the installation goes. But as far as the engineering goes, it's, it's something trainable, like if, if you have the one-on-one -on -one basis and you're willing to learn, and there's always a way to, to get it done. So I mean, you don't deal with general contracts? We do, yes, yes. We are actually um, designing, developing, and building and maintaining this building on behalf of the landlords. Uh, our biggest landlord, are Two, two type of categories. Uh, Indian, that uh, we, we do a lot of business with them, and we have pension fund. So these are our main um, source of our income to build those sites. Uh, but yes, we are dealing directly with the GC general contractors, and we are interacting with them, we, we monitor their work, we, uh, send them deficiency letters, we ask them to fix it. But as far as the engineering and project management and asset management goes, is uh, everything would be under our umbrella. Yes. 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 They're putting it. <laughs> the, yes, uh, they're actually keeping their, what they're saying, their statements. They, they, they promise to reduce the total cost of your electricity bill up to 25%. However, until you only reduce it 17.5% so far. They're committed to another 7.5, but I don't think that they would do it. They said if they could, they would reach out to that. But this is only one. They didn't tell you that what they have in the other hand. They're introducing three tax right now. They already did the very first one, you're paying for your gas. Have you noticed in last, uh, as soon as they said that 25%, the next day the gas you pay was four cents higher? You didn't notice it. Did you notice that in your payments of your electricity bill that you're paying for the uh, global adjustment fees that actually this fee is addressed for the, all of the investment development that the Ontario government makes to get it out of from your pocket? You didn't know. Perhaps you don't know that in near future, in a year or two, there will be a tax, they call it cap and trade tax. 
is carbon tax. There is a commitment based on the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, Canada should suppose by 2030, their building, that your building should be carbon emission free. Everything, your wall, column, floor, cabinets, everything. Or you have to pay a certain tax for the carbon you cause to be to spread to the air just to make that, for example, this laptop for you. It's like a government tax. You don't see it, but you have to pay. So in the larger scale, in future, when you have an industry, they will tell you, you need to get to carbon emission free by 2030. But what is your short term goal plan? What would be your reduction plan in next five years and next five years later after that? Then you would say, okay, I'm planning to reduce it 5% every year. You say, okay, so I'll reduce your permit to, reduce, to, to create carbon. I will reduce it 5% every year based on your commitment. So do it. So you either improve your equipment, you make sure you have an efficient system that has less carbon to make or is environmental friendly, or you come to us. We build the site, we get the same uh, sort of uh, license that it is an industrial building, but not that we don't do create any, uh, any carbon, we are actually saving carbon. And then you will buy it from me. This is a, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong on the numbers. I know that regulation took place in California 15 years ago, and right now it's $8,000 billion market. It's like a stock market by itself. Like, it's like an open trade. You, you can buy it in the morning, you don't need it, but you sell it with a high price to somebody else. This is another one. So for that fact, there will be a lot of more tax would be applied. There is another tax you, you would pay, it would be peak demand of your building. Based on the, the power that you're sucking from, from the grid, you should pay a certain rate for it. For example, if you have a one megawatt uh, building, it just consumes one megawatt at the peak, they will charge you based on one megawatt peak. And let's say you pay a cent for, for every kilowatt that you're using. And then they will tell you if your peak demand would just be increased from one megawatt to two megawatt, then you have to pay 1.101%, you have to pay more. And that small tiny bit well, would add up a lot for you. That's 10%. 10%. But when we're talking about like, I've seen bills like from utilities that their industries are paying $30,000 per month for the it's a lot of money. In a year, they're paying almost 400K. Is, so if you can design a system to save not 400, 300K for that, wouldn't they go with you? Isn't it a good market for you? I, I think my short answer, I would jump on it. If I pay $400,000 for my bill, and then later I see I only pay $100,000, I would right away jump on it. But there is a couple of more programs. It's not, it's not going to be one single program helps you in future. How it does help you, uh, in future we will have a design build system. We are combining the renewable energies together to make a market work. And that's the market. Um, and in future, government would not invest on any utility escape um, electricity plant. No nuclear plant anymore. The idea is to make a microgrid utility energy providers. For example, imagine your street or combine a couple of streets together and then you have a, a small generator nearby that generates electricity for all of those households right there. What it does do, it, it helps the government to shut down the, the transmission lines. So imagine if you have a nuclear plant that you have a transmission line, they cannot shut it down because the voltage should be maybe 10 million volts. Nobody can get close to those ones. But in future, by 2030, they, they can switch the load from nuclear plant to these renewable energies, and they can maintain or uh, remove those existing ones. And that's where government is interested to, to, to put its focus on. So what's the trend for residential? Uh, trend for residential, uh, 
beauty aspect, uh, I would recommend everybody to, to consider Tesla. Uh, honestly, uh, it's, it's more the expensive. The yes, yes, those shingle cells. Uh, they're pretty new. Uh, the price wise, they're not there yet. But it's much better than this type of module we put on. Now it is in Ontario, you look at it, you, you don't find a detached house less than a million dollars, right? So this system that you put it on for 10 kilowatt, it will cost you around, at most, $28,000. But the price for, for residential, you can't really use them in a massive scale because in a research that has been done, the max consumption of the household in North America would not be no more than 12,000 kilo, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 12 kilowatt uh, for the system. So if you can't make it 12 kilowatt, but these guys are only allowing us for 10, so you're right, For it's just barely enough for you to give you enough electricity for your house. Well, thank you خیلی خیلی پریزنتیشن خوبی بود من به شما تبریک میگم خیلی تشکر بود